Hey everyone, super quickly, this is a podcast that I recorded with Evan, and we are talking about our predictions for Witch Queen. My microphone is going to sound a little bit different in this recording, because that's the recording from his end. It's just one of those things which made the recording just a little bit easier. Working on a lot of content for you guys going forward, and also working a lot on Dynasty. We should have more to show you very soon. There is a lot behind the scenes that I'm not going to show until the final release, so that's exciting, hopefully. Anyway, on to our predictions for Witch Queen. I hope you enjoy the video, and thank you very much for watching. Please go ahead and also check out Evan's channel. It's linked down below in the description. Thank you, like, thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, wow. I mean, it's been a wild year, and there is a lot of content to cover for this video, and there's a lot of things that I think a lot of people have questions about. So... Just as a reminder for everybody who maybe didn't watch the last episode that Bife joined us on, but um, it was a full podcast sort of scenario with some visuals to help out here and there of basically what was going to happen in Beyond Light, our predictions of what was going to happen with evidence, with lore tie-ins, and with what realistically could happen given in a sense of marketing and what's possible from the studio and not just like a 4chan leak or a pace spin leak or whatever kind of leaks that people are always talking about. What we can feasibly see happening. And I think it's fair to say we got we got a few things wrong, but we got quite a bit of it spot on, I think. I seem to remember us having... Like, when we talked to Cabal, I'm pretty sure we went over Keitel at least briefly. And with the Fallen stuff, uh, I'm pretty sure last time we were spot on with that. We said that Aramis and the whole Zero Hour plotline was, like, going to be fueling the whole entire DLC. And, I mean, I think we hit it right on the head. Um, mm. I don't know if we brought up the... Like, I'd have to go back and watch it. Um, I don't know. Did we bring up The Stranger, like, a ton? I think we... I think we did because it was part of the promotional material at the time. I don't. Mm. I don't fully remember. When did we even do that? Because I don't even know if Beyond Light had been announced back at that point in particular. Like I think it was the dawn three weeks prior to us even having it there. So it was like we had like wild guesses, but realistically nobody knew. Yeah. And so a lot of it was sort of bound up in this thing of like. We had a pyramid ship, man. Come on, like they gotta do something with darkness. Yeah, that's like... right. Oh my god, this is in season. Of... <laughs> this is in season because... of the worthy. Oh my yeah. god. The dark times when everything felt like it was it was not great in seasonal content land, but now it's okay. It's different. It's it's totally fine. Oh my and, god, this is like and also so... like what? we didn't know about stasis. How no, crazy is that? we didn't at all. <laughs> Did we even talk about a dark? Did we talk about a darkness subclass? Did we talk about like, oh my god, somebody somebody is gonna have to remind us in the comments because like I I haven't listened to this in a very very long time. Um, but wow, yeah, no, we didn't even have. Oh, I did bring up the stranger at some point. I think. Um, mm, I'm I'm looking yeah. back through it all right now. Like we didn't have any promotional material for Beyond Light. We didn't have any like. That's awesome. Oh my god. We just we just went ahead and said, like, come on, man, there's a pyramid ship. It's got to be happening. Now. Right. And if, uh. we, and if we're wrong, we just look stupid and that's fine. Because, you know, we're predictions. I mean, <sighs> we're probably going to do that a bunch this video anyway. So, I mean, you know. Yes. I would fully, I would bet that we we're going to get a lot wrong in today's video. But I would also bet that we'd get some things close to right. Mm, absolutely. Okay, well, everybody, if you are not already subscribed to Bife, please do so. I'm going to check out his channel right now. I know you're very, very close to... Uh, hold on, where... I know you're extremely, close extremely to close to a million. Yeah, you are... You are... Ah, oh, man, you're at the echelon. You're almost there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's looking like Witch Queen might be a very exciting time for another reason. Uh, but yeah, man, it's very, very close. And uh, on that same note, everybody who is uh, watching this over on my side of things, go ahead and also check out Evan, uh, who of course has been making videos for quite some time now, and uh, was just branched over 250k. And 
gets consistently more views than a channel at 250k should and it's like <laughs> breaking down all them barriers is like hey let's go ahead and do some law stuff now it's doing pretty good you know yeah um i just started uh thanks to thanks to mylan um i've been actually like learning quite a bit about just at least the basics of some of the lore in the game and i think it's cool um talking to you about some of the lore and then talking with him about the lore because even though it's even though it's the same story that Bungie puts out, there's different interpretations from both of your mm -hmm. channels, and it's really cool seeing how that goes down. And I will say it too, here and now, just as we finish up our little preamble, I always thought that you were at very least an honorary member of content creators who do lore. Uh, you, you, you always sort of like reached into the sort of Venn diagram of that box, just, just so you know. Like, <laughs> you've you always been one of the real ones. You've always been one of the homies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I I like all right. So I went to I went to college for writing for TV. So I like when when good writing is like displayed on uh, like fully. I love it. So whenever there's like a chance to look at good writing and how a good like sentence flows and stuff like that, like I'm a nerd for that stuff. So I, I've always just loved any story that can be told. Mm. I won't waste too much time and sit there and try to nerd out with you about Battlestar Galactica in that case. I'll just leave it be for the time. <laughs> but we should totally do that at some point. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. Um, predictions. Where do we want to start? I feel like um, we, we have a few notes in front of us, of course, because guiding a long conversation like this. Uh, I think we agreed that most appropriate that we start with the hive considering that of course it is going to be Salvathun, the witch queen and a hive expansion coming up yeah, so, yeah. um why don't, why don't you start it off mr bife so as far as predictions go for everything there is obviously i think probably the biggest thing to take over here and to really get to the nitty-gritty of as far as predictions are concerned is brick holding Salvathun, obviously uh and the big thing that we have uh, jumping on here. It's not the first thing we've got listed in the entirety of it, but I think it's one of the biggest questions that's immediately going to drop in the story campaign, and even just finishing up Season of the Lost. Is Savathun's death going to be involved? Uh, is she actually going to die in the story campaign? And by that same token, there is the question of whether Savathun has some kind of involvement in the raid. I think we'll be able to touch on that very quickly and say, like, hey, you know, Maybe there's plot that comes from that, but ultimately, I'm gonna th I'm gonna throw that one to you because I know I have my own thoughts. But what do you think? Do you reckon that Savathun is gonna live or die? <sighs> so it's very up in the air, right? And there's a lot of people that you know go back to the whole um, part with her worm and the fact that her worm has her constantly needing to be tricking people. If you guys are unfamiliar, watch Bife's video on Savathun's lore. Um, but there is this whole idea that. Sabathun always has to be tricking people to feed her worm as well as you know killing and other stuff like that but basically she always has to be tricking well there's been this idea that Sabathun wants her worm removed i mean that's been like kind of the plot line for this season and x y and z so if Sabathun gets the light that means that she doesn't have the tie that maybe she doesn't have a tie to her worm anymore and if she has the light and she doesn't have her worm anymore then that means that she may not even need to be tricking people. It may mean that she avoids death because she somehow convinces us that she's a part of the light now and that she has no need to be tricking us. She has no need to be following um, the sword logic and constantly be tricking us anymore. But on the other hand, all I can think about as a player would be you know, I'd be kind of frustrated if Savathun's story didn't end in the Witch Queen. I mean, we just got done with Aramis, who is not dead, according to the health bar, isn't dead. So Savathun not dying, I think, would piss a lot of people off. Um, mm. And I want to point to one very important thing with Savathun. In, in regards to Savathun, um, there is on Bungie.net, on the Witch Queen page... Um, and this is light spoilers, so again, I think this whole video is probably going to deal with some form of spoilers, so if there hasn't been a spoiler warning before, um, just spoiler warning now. Um, basically, in the new raid, there is a line, the, the, the line for the new raid is, Among the swamps of Savathun's throne world, 
lies a sunken pyramid. Alongside your fire team, venture inward and confront the ancient danger imprisoned within. Now we know in the Taken King that Oryx, Oryx didn't die in the campaign. He was killed in the raid. Well, if Savathun in if Savathun wants to follow that same plot, I don't see an ancient danger imp imprisoned within the raid being a bigger Savathun. So I do think that she's going to die in the campaign. However, I don't think it's going to be like a throwaway villain type of scenario, you know? Mm, I, I completely agree. And more so than that, I feel like the throwaway villain trope that so many Destiny villains such as Aramis have fallen into is purely built on the fact that we haven't had time to explore them as characters. And I feel like Savathun appropriately bucks that trend and as a result is actually the best villain that we've had thus far. Um, and, you know, obviously the conclusion to that story is probably going to come in the Witch Queen story campaign. And even if it does ultimately bleed over somewhere into the raid, I'm completely with you when I sit there and agree that it's almost certainly not going to be Savathun based on that wording alone. I mean, the fact that it's an ancient evil that was imprisoned there implies from the very beginning that it can't be Savathun. And whilst it might have some tie to her or some influence, which I kind of doubt considering other things that we'll discuss soon, I feel as though it still seems very likely that we're going to be looking at that being the focus for it instead. And maybe this is bringing us to a point where we sit there and say that Savathun's death is instead something that signals the plot point of what's going on in the pyramid. It's one of those moments where you sit there and perhaps in her final dying breath it's like, by the way, hey, go check this thing out. It's kind of bad news and I've had it contained in my throne world the whole time. Obviously not quite like that, but you know. It feels as though it's going to be something that's very different, especially with Savathun's changing allegiances. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a big point. And the fact that it's not only something very different, but I think the fact that it's also inside of a pyramid ship imprisoned <laughs> is like extra, extra cool and more terrifying. And, you know, maybe it's the I don't I don't want to jump the gun here because I always do this. But, you know, maybe it's the supposed darkness race. Who knows? Like, I don't know mm. what else could be inside of a pyramid imprisoned. Could it be a darkness race? Could it be, you know, I may, this this might be crazy, but somehow it, it could be a worm god. Is it Tanix riding a worm god? I, I is don't know. It, is it darkness Tanix? <laughs> is it dark Tanix? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, no, honestly, it's, it's one of those moments where it's very undefined and the fact that it's inside a pyramid in the first place, it opens up a whole realm of possibilities that I don't think anybody has realistically seen before. The closest thing I could possibly predict to it is that it would be a Taken raid, but even then, whilst that's, I feel, somewhat more likely, maybe it's Taken and Scorn considering changing allegiances, which is something that we need to go ahead and just briefly touch on at some point later anyway. Um, yeah. I think it's much more likely that it is Taken, and I feel like it is also presenting us with that possibility of will we see that final darkness um, enemy that we've been looking for generally and that has clearly been permeating the plot and is clearly going to make a big move at some point. Um, or is it perhaps simply the fact that we need to abandon the idea of an extra enemy in the in the long run? I don't know, but I'm still I'm still kind of in your corner where I sit there and I say that it's got to be its own species. I feel like it is. Yeah, we've been sitting here for seven years, um, uh, eight years now. Uh, and wondering like, hey, you know, when is it time to see, because we've seen the light, we've seen us, like we've seen all this stuff, but when is it time to see a true darkness enemy? And, you know, you could argue that some of the enemies that we've already fought have been darkness enemies, but not not in the way that I think people want to see. And uh, it's been since the Taken and then the Scorn were the last, the Scorn were the last new enemy introduced. So I think it's like a... I think it's about time that we see something new. <clears throat> mm. I think it's also very possible that whatever we're going to see in that raid has some major, major story plot points, the same way that we saw with Deepstone Crypt, having some major plot points for um, Clovis Bray and for Tanix and understanding what the Deepstone Crypt was and, and what it is now mm. and all this stuff. I think, like, 
we're going to see another major story told within the raid, and I'm so excited for that. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing that I think Bungie has learned over the last however many years it is. You know, raids themselves were always really big, poignant moments for Destiny's story, just based on the fact that it was meant to be that pinnacle challenge. But Bungie has gotten a lot better with environmental storytelling in raids, and I feel as though the Garden of Salvation does a halfway good job at it, but Last Wish and um, Deepstone Crypt are masterful. Yes. They are absolutely spectacular as far as telling the story of what's going <laughs> on and giving you that moment where you can sit there and look at the statue in the middle of the Deepstone Crypts and just after security encounter and be like, oh, this is why this was important. Okay. Yep. You know, like, these are the moments that I think we should fully expect. And I mean, aside from anything else, it, it being in the pyramid ship alone implies that uh, the sort of direction that we're going. And I think fairly signposts everything that moves in the direction of the expansion after this, which of course is going to be Lightfall. So, yeah, like, it's I to bring it all back to the point, generally speaking, the raid plot is probably going to have something that stems from Savathun's death and is almost certainly going to be different. Um, oh, yeah. I think, yeah. I think like, one of the biggest things um, is that it, it felt like Savathun was always associated with the, on, with the incoming um, pyramid ships all the time. Um, we go back to... But we go back to Shadowkeep in the moon. That was a very much a, you know... Savathun wasn't, obviously, the major player, but if you read the lore on, on Shadowkeep you would know that Savathun's involvement in Shadowkeep was a big one. Like, her plan was to trick... Hash I think it was to trick Hash Ladoon into thinking that Hash Ladoon could beat us by raising the Scarlet Keep and all this other stuff, and we end up beating her, but there's also a pyramid there. And then there's also this whole... The whole season of Arrivals dealt with Savathun and the pyramid ships at the same time, so... I wonder if, mm -hmm. like, those two are just tied so well together that maybe she has some sort of deal with, with whatever, with, with the darkness. Maybe she has a very, very deep deal that we don't even know about. Maybe she's playing both sides. She's trying to trick us into giving, us, giving her the light so that she can actually defend herself against the dark. Like, we don't know. It does reach to this very interesting series of conclusions that one can draw. Um, which is maybe not the idea that Savathun even has a deal, but maybe the idea that she's smart enough to understand where real power lies. And I think that most crucially, out of all of that, she's been watching us. She's been watching the Guardians, and she knows that the Darkness was reaching out to us and trying to give us a degree of its power. And I think that this is kind of where she's settling in. She's always had the power of darkness. She's been a hive god, one of the more powerful players within the side of darkness, although obviously subservient to the entity itself, whatever the darkness's true form really is. And with all of that, you then sit there and wonder, okay, so if the Guardians have killed a hive god before and they were wielding the light, surely that's where Savathun sits there and thinks, okay, well, in order to be more powerful, then maybe I need to stop having such a restricted view of the way that power in the universe works. Maybe I need to wield the light. Maybe I need to wield both. And so I think, honestly, that's kind of where everything sort of verges for Savathun. This understanding that even down to, as has been discussed so many times this season, her worm. The fundamental thing that ties her to the darkness and gives yeah. her this constant... Um, constant need and constant um, source of power whenever she enacts darkness through the sword logic, it's still something that restricts her. Because if she wanted to ally with someone genuinely, out of a sense of loyalty or out of a sense of being genuinely in alignment with their worldviews, as opposed to for the sake of trickery, she can't do that. And that's a restriction that can potentially paint her into a corner. And you know, things like this are the reason that Oryx died. You know, it's this it, it's part of the overall thing that allowed us Guardians to even get to a point where we could defeat him. You know, he's defeated in two different 
sections by Power of the Light, and prior to that, he set up for failure by Marasov, who effectively used bomb logic as opposed to sword logic too, which to give the most basic breakdown, ignore everything that I've said about bomb logic, just think of it as saying it's another way of her using light to beat the darkness as well. Like, that's the reason she's still alive, that's the reason that we Guardians were able to do anything in the Taken King. So, I think Sabathun genuinely sees us and sees that we're kind of like this new axis of power in a certain sense. And to really become powerful, she needs to abandon any restrictions in a similar manner that we have. I think <clears throat> I, I fully agree. And I think actually you brought up something that, um, you know, it's it's pretty like we're, we, we kind of had this uh, this outline for everybody that's wondering. We, we kind of have like an outline of ideas. But when you brought up the fact that, you know, maybe it's not that she has a deal, but that she's embracing both. Um, it started to make me think like, because I just made a video on the nine and just like what they're interested in and how they can kind of be role players. And they seem to take interest in characters that go beyond their, I, I forgot what the word is, but it's like beyond their, their they've transcended their design. That's the right, that's the right saying. Mm, so exactly. I wonder if because... Sabathun may be trans may be transcending her design by embracing both light and dark fully. I wonder if that means that the nine will have maybe that's their way to become a part of the story again. Maybe they're interested again. Um mm. that's just that's just kind of like the only way that I could see them even having a place in this DLC. I complete you know what I completely agree with regards to it because you are completely correct. Um when it comes to transcending the design this is basically the entire subplot of Season of the Drifter from way back in Forsaken's era. Um, and back then, during the... Um, uh, it's not Visions of the Nine. Uh, you would do these weekly missions where basically you would get an interesting bit of context oh, invitations. about characters. There we go. Invitations of the Nine. Yeah. Um, they actually talk in the first one of these about how there are these characters which as you say have transcended their design um they talk in sort of allegory for the first two of them um and the first of them is an hourglass counting down with infinite patience uh and the second is some kind of blade uh sharpened anew and those two characters are referencing first the exo stranger an infinite an infinite um, hourglass. hourglass counting yeah. down with patience and uh, the blade is Eris Morn mm -hmm. um, and then of course they sit there and say and the Trejan and you'll notice very keenly that these three players then make up the so called quote unquote dark vanguard that you'll see on Europa and that you'll have conversations with in uh, the campaign of Beyond Light and who of course have all embraced darkness to a degree and have basically said, yeah, no, in spite of the fact that we are in this place and that light is perhaps something that drives all of us and that we are, you know, effectively on that side, we're all using darkness to some extent. Eris Morn embraces it after Shadowkeep, which it turns out is exactly what happens with that one really ominous cutscene. She actually just obtains stasis power right then and there. She, she sits there and she grabs it and it's entirely hers to use from that point onward. The Drifter has always embraced darkness and has been using it consistently throughout Gambit. You know, if ever you've invaded, you'll know there's the chance of him saying that line of embrace the darkness, take out those guardians. And that's a clear enough indication. Yep. As the line goes for the Exo Stranger, she sits there and she says, I was always, I was not forged in light. Um, and consistently there is the theme with her that she has come from another place entirely. And if you now understand also the little context behind how exos are made, which, spoiler alert, for those of you who don't know or haven't played Deepstone Crypt, go ahead and do that. They're partly made with darkness. You have three characters that have integrally transcended their design and have started to realize that there is a place in the universe for both. We are actually slated by the Nine to be the fourth individual to transcend. But the Nine in their invitations also talk about all sorts of other characters and where everything else is going to go um, in Destiny. And they have these implications for all sorts of grand designs going forward. I think that Savathun, if she is doing this, does have the potential to enter into them. 
And so it realistically goes to that question of, is she using both light and darkness or just the light now? So yeah, that's it's really good. And honestly, I'll say this, dude, if you are correct and if the Nine do have some involvement, that's going to be so fascinating and it's going to really highlight their place in the story a lot more as sort of understanding that transcending both lines is what's really important. Yep, and I, I can't wait for it. I feel like there's just, there's so many... There's so many places this goes, everybody. Like, you you gotta think that this character, Savathun, has been a part of the story for so long, and has been a, been kind of like, I don't want to say, because retconned isn't the right word, but Bungie has kind of forced their hand to push Savathun as a part of almost every single plot. Like, she's, like, she always has her hand in everything. Um, Savathun is just this character that like they just they have to get right or else people will be very frustrated and i think they know that and i think that's why when we talk about the hive and we talk about sabathun and, and what happens and will she die in the campaign will she be a raid boss like oryx um i think like that's why they put such a heavy em emphasis on the campaign being this and and i'm quoting them this doom eternal or titanfall 2 like campaign that is just like so such a cool campaign start to finish like that's why they put their marbles in, in that is because they know that this character is this important that's why this whole year um the whole entire every single season has had to deal with savathun the reveal of osiris being savathun all year has been one of the coolest parts of the entire year and i don't know i just think like they know that this villain is is their big is their biggest villain in a very long time but it also is why we kind of wanted to make this video too, because again, Sabathun, after Sabathun's gone, then what? It's kind of like that moment in a lot of Marvel fans ask themselves, after Endgame, then what? I don't think Bungie is at their Endgame moment yet, but setting up that Endgame moment involves having Sabathun's story come to an end. Mm, I completely agree. And it really is one of those moments where if... If we're looking at everything to do with the darkness, and if that is Kang, then I'd say that Savathun is our equivalent of Thanos, effectively, at this particular moment. And I grant that, you know, that's going to be a very interesting kind of, like... <laughs> It's gonna be really, it's gonna be really weird to see that era come to an end. Yeah, uh, because we've, we've been dealing with it for so long. But I feel like it is very important that they do get that right. On that note, by the way, because you brought it up, and I feel like that's another important question, uh, yeah. which we also have listed down here. Thoughts? Do you think that Osiris survives, or do you think that Osiris is dead? So, the the story writer in my head. I'll just start at the beginning. The story writer in my head was very, very annoyed when Bungie seemingly killed Osiris, or not killed Osiris, but uh, had Osiris lose Segura off screen and all this other stuff. And I was very annoyed that all we got was a letter. But now that things have started to make a lot more sense, it's like, well, you can't really show a cutscene of Osiris getting kidnapped by Savathun and, and like taken over and, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like, you can't really show that on screen because then that would just reveal a little bit too much and people would be wondering too much for the whole year um i do think osiris is alive because i'm just following those rules in my head it's like you don't kill a character off screen so i do think he's alive but whether or not he will die is to be seen i i think he's alive at the moment though yeah I completely agree with him being alive at the moment. Aside from anything else, the lore and the wolf tone draw bow implies that we can see from his perspective that, yeah, he has been alive and he's been able to vaguely see Savathun doing as she's been doing over the last year with his body, basically taking him for a massive joyride, as it were. Um, but it's one of these moments where I sit there and I look at it and I think that there are potential plot threads that let us reach forward further into the year and maybe even just immediately into the campaign of Witch Queen, which are worth addressing. The really big one for me, and this is something that we don't have listed down, but I'm sure this is something that has been brought up many a time and I'm sure something that everyone's thinking of, is uh, that there are the Hive Ghosts and then there's Savathun's Hive Ghost, which looks a little bit different from the rest of them. And I have a question and I'm wondering whether that maybe is the case that you're sitting there and looking at an undead version of Sagira, 
uh, Osiris's ghost. I no one has any way of confirming that, of course, and it's not at all well known whether that's the case. But if that is, I think it would confirm a lot of people's suspicions, and perhaps more importantly. You sit there and you have this kind of Chekhov's gun moment where it's like, okay, well, why didn't we see Sagira die? It's like, because she's here and it's this horrifying, demented hive version of her that we have to do. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't even I, think about that. I think also, like, if you take a look at something that uh, is really, it really pushes um, at the kind of character threads of Osiris and Saint 14. Uh, both of them have had these quests where they have been going after each other and have always been working with each other in the sense of they are literally lovers, you know, they're partners. And so it's this thing of, I think you wouldn't necessarily have a story where Osiris dies because I think the moment that he realizes that he's lost his ghost and that there maybe is this Segura plot point, it's him and Saint-14 in the throne world. And it's this thing of them perhaps joining us as we are victorious over Savathun. And maybe it's Saint that pulls out perfect paradox. And then Osiris is like, no, and grabs the gun. And it's like, this is mine. Like, oh my this, God. This kill is mine. There's so you know, many, you... there's so many cool ideas here. Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, realistically, I feel like you could insert a lot of characters into that particular role and it would be very appropriate in a certain sense. I mean, Crow has much beef with Sephathun as well. So I can imagine that him pulling out, say, I don't know, a weapon that he is very attached to or has some kind of story connection to Ace of Spades. Um, <laughs> Would be, you know, that would be a very kind of neat kind of circumference moment where you sit there and you see all of Savathun's machinations coming back to her. her. But, you know, that could be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's not well defined what that kind of moment could be. But, you know, moments like that potentially happening point to this idea for me that Savathun has not killed Osiris and won't kill Osiris. And I think you mentioned this earlier. Her needing to lie and her deceptions and all of this is tied necessarily to the existence of her worm. And when her worm is exercised, or exercised, excised, the no, it is exercised. No, it's exercised. It? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was right the first time. Sorry, I sat there. I was like, no, the worm isn't on a. <laughs> the worm, worm isn't on a treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The worm's on a treadmill. Oh, the worm is. Uh, the worm is pushing plate. Uh, no. Like, <laughs> Yeah, um, when um, you're looking at the idea of Savathun's um, worm being exercised, you then acknowledge, as you said, she doesn't necessarily need to lie again. And with her not needing to lie, it could be this case that she is genuinely setting things up so that she can indeed release Osiris, which I think, you know, is, is part of a calculated bargain in her head, but also it's showing genuinely the point of saying characters can change, and it, I think, represents a really important crossing point from Savathun's story as a being of darkness to her story as a being of light. You know, I, I feel as though that's definitely something which would be a very strong signal to the player of saying, like, hey, the world has kind of been turned on its head and you're still going after her, but that doesn't immediately feel right from the start. You know, like, yeah, there's there's all sorts of story potential, but I think a lot of it hinges with cool ideas on Osiris still being alive. There's I agree. I, I think Osiris being alive makes more sense than like, I, I think that his story isn't done. Do I think he will die, though, in the future? Um, I actually do think he will die in the future, though. And I and I, I, I think here's why. Um. I want to say it's a trope at this point in, in TV and, and movies and games is passing the torch, you know, um, Crow mm. is very much Osiris's. Well, I mean, I guess he was Savathun's um, disciple, if you want to kind of say it like that. Like he's he's the 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 trainee and I guess Savathun was really the, the mentor for him. But Osiris, it was supposed to be Osiris, was the mentor for Crow. So if Crow is learning the ways, learning how to act, learning this and that, learning how to properly be himself and how to properly um, handle himself in combat and in conversation, it's like there's a part of me that wonders if it's a I, I hate to keep going back to Marvel, but I part of me wonders if it's like a Spider-Man to 
Iron Man scenario where, mm. you know, Iron Man passes and now you have Spider-Man holding the reins and l- l- taking all that information and kind of learning and becoming a stronger hero. Or a Captain America to Captain America kind of situation. True. Yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, as well as that, you know, there there is a reinforcing point there, which is that Osiris has kind of had many disciples and many apprentices, not least of which, who is a key character in the story of Witch Queen, Ikora. Ikora, who is not only the Warlock Vanguard and one of the most powerful Warlocks we know, but was also at one point his apprentice, you know, who was basically his second and took over the duties of the Vanguard with him, you know? And if we're going to look at two characters that get impacted in a very similar manner with that, you just put those two in a room and they hash it out with that. And all of the differences that you would know, considering that one of them experienced a quote-unquote fake Osiris and the other experienced Osiris over many years and as good friends and you know, as the idea of him always being the grumpy mentor. So yeah, no, it's it's absolutely a trope that could be fulfilled there in that particular thing. Yeah, I just I I think somebody has to die. I you know it sounds it sounds harsh, but I think somebody has to die in the story for the story to to have that same meaning, that same impact. There has to be a character that that dies. And it can't, mm. if it's not going to be Savathun, or if it is going to be Savathun, somebody on our side also has to pay the price. I I, I do feel like that needs to happen. Mm, yeah, that I agree. It might, it might also be one of these moments of um, sitting there and taking a look at everything that has gone forward um, with the story. I think that when you sum up the idea of a heroic sacrifice, maybe that can be the method by which Savathun tries to die. And I say that knowing everything we've said about the raid and knowing that her allegiance from light to dark has changed. So it's one of these moments where you take a moment to acknowledge if she really is trying to take on the sort of true responsibility of the light. There's the stuff that the speaker kept on saying back in Destiny 2 Vanilla where it's like, you know, um, a guardian's life is ultimately sacrificed and is then death, which of course is followed by the greatest burden of all time to good old Dominus Gaul. But you yeah. know, if she is genuinely trying to push forward this idea of like, I am now using the light, maybe it's one of these moments where she genuinely proves this is the reason why I am able to wield it. You know, there is something noble underneath it all for me. And maybe she does something that allows us a chance at killing whatever's inside the pyramid. Oh my god, there's so many cool ideas here. I there's like the the, the difference between Beyond Light and the Witch Queen is that in Beyond Light, you know, you had a lot of things thrown up in the air because it was a start it was the it was the start of the final trilogy for Destiny. Right? So you mm-hmm. had you had all these different ideas, but like sure you kinda could you you could kind of poke at things. Well, now the story is progressing, and the story is progressing hard in one direction. So it's it's trying to nail not like an idea of like, oh, this person could be out there, that person could be out there, that thing could be out there. It's more like, what are their intentions? Where do we go next? And who is responsible for X, Y, and Z? Like, there's so many different possibilities. So um, I think, to be honest with you, Sabathun storyline they've done such a good job with to the point where now we're sitting here going is she actually going to be good once she loses the worm like I think that's just how well they've done this season to keep players like do we trust Sabathun do we not like I think that's the thing that she's always done is try to get people to trust her or not trust her and play that game back and forth and constantly talk about her so Mm. they've done a really good job of writing this character and I can't wait to see it in the Witch Queen Absolutely. I will say this, um, for the moment, still don't trust her. <laughs> no, not me either. Me either. Uh, but yeah, there's so much that we could see revealed. And honestly, I'm just, I, I likewise, I'm really interested to see the direction they take it. Um, crucially, though, that's not where the story of the Hive ends. No. And it's not even where the story of the Loose and Brood ends. We have no clue what's going on with them, but... Most crucially of all, I think everybody has that kind of 
itching question in the back of their mind, which is effectively, hey, we killed Oryx, and in Witch Queen we're probably going to kill Savathun. That's two out of three, which ain't bad, but that's not the whole triumvirate. And if we're looking at where things turn next, there is a very obvious pointer, and that is Shiva Wrath. And so I think it's worth sitting there and talking about her for a second. What do you think, if anything, is going to be her story in Witch Queen, and over the next year, for that matter? Yeah, so Oryx was... We'll, we'll just we'll just quickly explain all three of them. Oryx was the explorer, the conqueror, always have. Well, actually, he was the explorer, always trying to take new land and always trying to constantly explore. That was like his tie to the worm, is that he always had to explore and, of course, kill. Um, Savathun's was always trickery, um, and then, of course, <laughs> killing. Um, and then Zivu is about conquering correct zivu is a full-on war general war zivu yes. is the hive god of war constantly and having to oof. be in war and so if oryx you know you saw him as a pretty cookie cutter well i wouldn't say cookie cutter but a solid villain with some cookie cutter parts to him like you know i'm the big bad evil i'm oryx bow to me i am gonna invade x y and z and Sabathun is about, can you trust me? Can you not? Playing the Loki card. Well, here comes Sabathun and Oryx's big sister, Zivu, who is just fully guerrilla warfare. I will take you down at any cost. I will die on this hill no matter what. You will not defeat me. I will I will defeat myself. Like I will I will be the only thing that can defeat me. That is Zivu. So if the other two had some parts of them that were even partially sympathetic to, to some people. Uh, Zivu does not. Zivu is mm. very much going to take your house, take a poop in it, and then light it on fire. That is Zivu. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very much one of those moments where you can kind of use the analogy of what everyone was, so to speak. Um, in the Books of Sorrow and all the stuff we've learned about Savathun, we know that each of those characters respectively you know, you maybe you could describe Oryx as a fencing sword, you know, to the point, definitely still a blade, but also very well refined with what his goal was and ultimately with his final decisions that he was going to make and ultimately what was going to determine the shape of his life, you know, even down to the moment where he died. It may not have been in the way that he expected, but it was definitely one of these moments where he somewhat fulfilled what he thought was going to be his purpose in the universe, which was furthering the final shape and helping to find that final vision of darkness and maybe in a certain way becoming a part of it. If you're looking at Savathun, she is a she is a shiv. She is a scalpel. She is precise, but more importantly, she is subtle and she is very underhanded. She's looking to constantly improve her odds through the sake of trickery she plays enemies off each other she almost never goes for a direct confrontation and that is what makes her very different from all the hive gods if oryx is a fencing sword and if savathun is a shiv shivu is a hammer shivu will come along and will not care and it's not to say that she's going to attack with reckless abandon because it's been made it's been made very clear that she's not just some idle construction hammer she is a war hammer she is made specifically for a purpose she's been forged in lots of different battles even from the earliest days when she went back and and this is way back in the deep hive lore but when she conquered the planet that she was originally from she was the one that seems to have been leading the armies in the largest of the fights you know she's not just a guerrilla fighter but also she's a savvy general she's someone who understands tactics and is able to pick apart her enemy's strategies she is war personified in all of its brutality and all of its stratagem and that i think is something which guardians have not really had to fight against it to me i, I don't know if this rings true with you and it's a reference from outside of destiny so maybe this isn't what people immediately are thinking of but when i look at shivu i uh, i see kind of someone who could potentially be a mix of someone who is incredibly brutal and warlike, but also someone who has this almost Thrawn-like level of strategy to her. And for me, at least, that means that she has the potential to be a really compelling villain if Bungie gets her writing correct. And so far, 
I think they kind of have. Yeah, um, I think when I think of when I think of the three um, the three hive gods, I think of Oryx being because I I always I, I'm I really like Norse mythology, um, so I always think of Oryx as an Odin. Odin is always has his, has his eyes on you and always conquering and always traveling and exploring. I think of obviously Sabathun as Loki, like always trying to trick you, always try, like always being involved, always kind of in the background, but is always playing each other against each other. And I think of Zivu very much like Thor, maybe not as stupid as Thor, but very, very much a refined Thor, almost a mix of Odin and Thor together, where very much smart, very tactile, uh, very tactical, I'm sorry, and also just extremely, extremely powerful and, and knows exactly what she wants to do. There is no questions that Zivu, when she, when she arrives somewhere, she is there to take it over. Like, th there's no questions. So I think that if the other two were the two pieces, I think that Zivu really is the rightful third sister to, to fight against and, and have a whole DLC for you know we can we can joke around about how all three um all three of them have had a major DLC and hopefully we go two for two on having great major DLCs but I really do think that Zivu's place it isn't in a season I think it's a major DLC mm. and I think that they definitely will build her character in because it like her character now appears to be sort of like the hand and commanding lieutenant of the darkness which is appropriate for the importance of her as a character, I think. But I also am completely with you, considering that we know that the expansions after Witch Queen fall into place respectively as Lightfall and as Final Shape. I don't believe for a second that we're going to be in a place where we sit there and we see Shivu getting her expansion anytime soon, because she is different. And I think that she is actually a character that can transcend darkness in the sense that even when it's defeated, her crusade against us and against the light doesn't end. I think that she is a constant threat, and even if you remove darkness from the picture, I think that conquest and war can still be her overriding need and her overriding desire within the universe. And not just because of the fact that that's kind of who she is as a personality, but also because of the fact that she still also has her worm, which requires her to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. There's I also, think, I mean, I think there's tires. a, I think, I think there's a part of me though that also, you know, it like Zebu's story could go past, could go into what Bungie has called the the beyond. You know, the, the even further than the final shape. You know, where the Destiny universe goes next. I think it's possible. But I also think there's another thing that's possible. So if Oryx, um, if Oryx made, the, well, I guess he he took the power, he he had the power to take um, that when he killed the worm god Yule, I believe, right? It was Yule. Uh, Akka. Akka. But... I'm sorry. Yes, Akka. It's a, it's a so <laughs> he killed he killed Akka, and he got the power to take. If Sabathun has the power to, I mean, wield the light and and resurrect Hive into the light, then there's a part of me that wonders if Zivu would go, okay, you know, you have, you have the Taken, you have the Light, let me have not only the Darkness, but let me command, I, I don't want to say a Darkness enemy race, because that, that would be a little bit too far, but maybe Zivu is involved in Lightfall. Maybe Zivu's plot in Lightfall is to try to take down the Light, like, but actually do it in a very much a war general way of not just, hey... Let's just run into it. Let's just try this. Let's try that. It's like, no, we've seen what works. Like, she's very smart. She's very calculated. And she's also very powerful. So I wonder if Zivu's plot could be to take down the light. Mm, and be a part of Lightfall. Yeah, and that would effectively give us a very powerful Cassus Belli against her for any future expansion. Um, but even when you sit there and you look at everything else that... Zivu does for the story. She's a binding thread that ties other groups together. So I think the, the most important one to note is that of the Cabal. When you take a look at the Cabal's story at current, they've been kicked off their homeworld, and the reason that Keitel, the current sort of major character in the Cabal story, the new Empress, is even here is because of Shivu Arath. And so 
you sit there and you have us guardians de de effectively declaring war on Shivu as much as the darkness, and the Cabal sit there and say, well, you want to kick Shivu off? Can we take you to Toro Battle? I feel like that's a very appropriate kind of story beat for the kind of beyond story arc for True. the Cabal in particular, and for Shivu. Something that then pushes the envelope and maybe gives us this kind of you know, reverse sweep of everything that Shivu has conquered. You know, I see this thing of Shivu being in Lightfall, succeeding, and then us pushing back against all those forces, maybe in final shape, and then us going with the Cabal, and then pushing Shivu back even further, and maybe part four is where we actually will finally get Shivu's full expansion. That, to me, is how that rings, at very least, and I'm not sure if that is the case, but... Either way, it gives us a lot of potential ground to cover. And I completely agree. I don't think Lightfall is her expansion, so to speak, but I do think that she's going to be involved. I I would love to see Tora Battle. I, I, I would love to see it. I would love to see just... Oh, man. It just it sounds awesome. Um, I think, realistically, um, when we talk about just the whole Cabal storyline, I think this would be actually a good place to pivot because... I don't think we have anything else really written down for the hive. We have, I mean, we already we just talked about Zivu, talked about Savathun raid. We talked about a little bit. We'll get back to the raid in a little bit here, but um, and Osiris. But let's talk about the Cabal, Keitel, Callus, and that whole plot line. Basically, to me, it does sound like we're gonna go to the Cabal's homeworld and take it back at some point. Will it be within these next three years? I have no clue. But it sounds like we're going to be fighting that battle at some point. Mm. The way that I see it, I think that it's realistic to say that there are the Cabal, at least at the moment, have three plot lines going on right now. There is the War of Succession between Keitel and her father, Callus, which is basically to say you have these two potential contenders for ruler of the Empire and a very clear split in the Cabal main species ranks which asks the question of who should we really follow. Then, following up after that, you have the question of Callus generally and his alignment to darkness, and how that maybe impacts their story going forward as far as the reclamation of Torah Battle is concerned, whether he is therefore in thrall of some darkness being, is there some tie to Shivu, something along those lines going on. And then you have the third part, which is not to do with the Cabal's main species at all, but is instead to do with the Scions, and is the story of the Scion Conclave, Amtec, and everything that went down in both the Season of the Worthy, the Season of Dawn, and most recently, of course, the Season of the Chosen. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, basically that last one all revolves around a series of Scions that we Guardians killed back in the Season of Dawn, there is a scion called Amtek, who was their direct sister. She was the one who tried to drop the massive Cabal space station, the Almighty, on us. It's not very well told within that season's story. It is hinted at in, like, two different places. The name Amtek is mentioned once in the lore. It is very poorly noted. But it is also noted that the Scion Conclave is a kind of a successor organization to Amtek's ambition, and they tried to assassinate Zavala in the season of The Chosen. So they're kind of a, an interesting interval, but they are very clearly another signpost for one of the potential stories of the Cabal as a faction going forward. So those are kind of the three big things. You've got Succession, you've got the Callus story arc, and what that does with the Darkness, and you've got the Scions. So across those three, there are so many different potential things to talk about. But I feel like the strongest one to talk about is definitely Keitel Callus at the moment. Yeah, I, I agree. I think so... To go to the to the Amtec um, and and the Scions plot line, I really do think that's something that can be squashed in one of these seasons for the Witch Queen. Because I know a lot of people are going to be wondering, like, what's past Witch Queen and where's where do the seasons go? I think that's a potential seasonal plot point is to completely crush that one and to, um, I mean, it kind of I, I don't want to say it was crushed at all, but I mean that cutscene of of Keitel slamming a Scion to the ground like. I want to say that, like, our point of view is very much, hey, you're in the wrong here, and, like, I, I have a feeling that that's a seasonal plot point that could be squashed. Now, is Amtec still alive? I have not been following the Amtec plotline. Is Amtec alive, or is is there anything that we know? 
So Amtech has not been mentioned thus far, but it's been made very clear that there are a group of Scions who are in that same kind of vein of what she wanted to do. Gotcha. You know? So it's one of those odd moments where if they're going to keep mentioning her in the story, they'd need to have her do a big reveal as the villain right. for that particular season. Well, if I and know if I know something about Bungie, um, it's that they typically like to align seasons with like seasonal content that's dropping even if it has nothing to do plot wise so like for example you know um vault of glass came out in a season that was focused around the vex and the fallen but you know it had a lot of vex tie into it um i wonder if there's a part of me that's like well you know we're getting i mean it, it looks like we're getting mars back and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit i'm sorry to keep jumping the gun but um i i almost <laughs> wonder if like because we're getting Mars back, and maybe there's some stuff to go with Mars coming back, the way that they unvaulted stuff from the Cosmodrome, I wonder if that means that, you know, they're kind of setting up a marketing-wise cabal-like season that would deal with Amtech, and maybe Amtech will be the villain for that season. I think you're not necessarily wrong there in certain respects. We know that Mars does at least feature in some regard so and i feel like there will definitely be a couple season um going on mars featuring in witch queen though has a very interesting and suspect nature to it and i think it really depends on how witch queen goes and the reason i say that is because mars of course was effectively abducted by the darkness and i think there is an indication that we have a vague idea of how this works after we've seen the glycan missions and whatnot so the real question is, if it's going to be based on Mars, is that because somehow Savathun has been able to wrest it out of the Martian anomaly that is now in Mars's place? You know, that's the that's the real question is, effectively, can Savathun be the hero we needed her to be? And can she unsunset something? Yeah. So that's that's kind of the, the big question mark. But I don't see it being impossible. You know, it's not only potentially within her power, but also I think it's something where it implies that this is why the darkness is taking her seriously. You know, this is why the darkness is looking at her as a threat that's worthy of really fighting. Um, and as far as the Cabal returning to Mars, I think the only other thing that they'd be potentially lacking uh, for that one is a reason why. And logistically, I think there is a very strong reason why for either the Cabal or for the Scions. For the Cabal, it's the fact that Mars is home to lots of their wartime installations for the Scout Legions, and effectively has a huge series of different supply caches and fortresses they can make use of. For the Scions, it's even bigger, uh, and it's literally planetoid-sized, and I think it's Phobos. And the reason that I think Phobos is important for the Scions is that it's long been stated and speculated that the Scion flayers were able to move Phobos out of its own orbit and pull it closer to Mars. And the plan for that originally is supposedly that they wanted to drop Phobos on Mars if the Cabal campaign there started to fail. But if the Scion flayers are powerful enough to move it out of orbit, that means with enough computing power and with enough foresight and even potentially just with them on their own, they could weaponize Phobos and take it in as a weapon that they could throw anywhere in the system. Oh my so god. So if you're really... So, I mean, you know, this may rely on the fact that they've done something to it before and the Cabal have had time to set up theirs, which is why it would be Phobos and not some other place, you know? Like, I mean, imagine the Hive just going along and being rather terrified one day when they realized that the moon was moving a little bit too quickly towards Earth. Um, but, you know, uh, Phobos being one of these places, if you create that story tie-in where you can tie it specifically to the Scions, you then have a very cool reason for a Martian season again. And again, totally depends on whether Mars ends up being the thing or not. Right, exactly. It comes back. Like, the evidence that... I would go off of is just the fact that we've seen it in the trailers a couple times, like especially in the most recent trailer. Um, that Bungie also has a very big history of leaving little Easter eggs in. Um, and Ikora on the board that she's looking at, um, it has the map layout of Destiny One's version of Mars, the uh, the very hot desert Mars, and not the very icy Mars. So, I mean, I guess they're both a desert, but this one is the hot kind. Um. Mm. Either way, I think that that's where I could possibly see the Cabal's storyline going in 
a seasonal type of drop. But when it comes to Callus and Keitel's relationship and what's going on with Callus, like where he is and what, where where is Madame Leviathan and all this other stuff, and um, I don't even know. I mean, the last time we got anything from Callus, I believe, was Presage, and it's very much like a very dark story of of what Callus apparently looks like now. And I'm really curious to one day see him. Hmm completely agree it's uh i i think as well when you look at the mainline story of the cabal i think that aside from seasonal stuff we can quite firmly put them to the side and put them down until after um destiny has finished its current era they are very much a quote-unquote beyond story and i think they're a beyond story in the sense that they will look like both friend and foe going forward you know, there are going to be some respects in which we're going to be fighting the Cabal, and then there are going to be some respects in which we're probably going to maintain some kind of alliance with Keitel. If you, if we're talking Cabal story, I'd say that the likelihood of us seeing Torah battle increases the further away we get from um, Final Shape. You know, I, I'd say that it's almost inevitable that we'll see that place. It's just realistically a case of when are we all going to make the big jump on a Cabal capital ship? Yeah, and that, I mean, I, <laughs> that sounds 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 amazing, but, you know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see, to be honest. Um, I, my, my mind always just goes like, what is, Ka like, what is Callus doing? What is his plot X, Y, and Z with Callus? Like, I, I, apparently my catchphrase today is X, Y, and Z. I don't know why, but either way, Callus <laughs> Callus has always interested me as a character um, because he was our first real look in Destiny Two, at least, at like a character that just had basically fully embraced the darkness and had like left us hints a, a long time ago that he was so much more powerful than almost everybody in the game, like. There is the Cabal, and then there is Callus. You know, it, it's just, it's just kind mm. of amazing to me to see where they're gonna go next with this character. And um, I've always just kind of wondered, like, what is going on with him at this point. So I don't know. Yeah, mystery has always been the key thing for anything to do with Callus's story, and I, I really love that. And in a certain sense, I kind of will be sad if ever we get to that point where we kill him, because it is that moment of damn the mystery has been unfolded you know it yeah. may be this it, i think it's probably going to be a very wizard of oz moment considering what we learn from the presage law which is that callus is this supposedly rather shriveled old cabal that basically hides inside the apertures and suits of the big giant resplendent version of himself and i do think that it's going to be a bit wizard of oz ish in the sense that it will be pulling back the curtain and seeing ah the wizard is in fact just a guy at a set of terminals and yeah. it's kind of sad really yeah you know, that, I, I, there, was, there was that massive joke way back when where it was like oh look callus is actually just a scion just a, just like, a scion chilling in a room <laughs> and like yeah it's like that uh have you ever seen the silent hill 2 easter egg uh, video where like at the end of silent hill 2 you can get like an ending where it's actually just like a, a dog that's just controlling everything the whole time no, I've not seen that. Oh, yeah, fantastic. you gotta look that up one day. It's so funny. And the whole credits is, like, the dog barking to, like, the uh, like the credit sequence. Like, the whole song is just the dog barking. Um, <laughs> it's it's so dumb. But basically, like, yeah, I, I've always kind of felt like that with Callus. Like, it's either one of two stories. It's either he really is this Julius Caesar type of Roman emperor that just is constantly conquering, but also uniting different factions of of cabal um or and, and different factions of just kind of everything like he just he has the menagerie he has all this different stuff within the leviathan or it's a scenario where he is very much a wizard of oz where it's just a dude behind a curtain the whole time mm. callus in fact always was five scions stacked on top of each other in a trench coat in a trench coat and a fedora oh man you hate to see it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, alas, the ignoble end of the Cabal story goes there. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of stories, and I think this would be a good time to transition to it, the Scorn. I know that's like mm. a very stark transition, but hey, we saw the Scorn in Presage, so let's talk about the Scorn in The Witch Queen. There has mm. been a picture 
on Bungie's press kit, which is very publicly available, um, that shows a Scorn out there on uh, Savathun's throne world in a weird sort of Scorn architecture, sort of Hive-inspired area. Basically, we learned last time that the Scorn, um, through, not Astral Alignment, but through the new activity from... Um, oh gosh, I'm... I know exactly what you're The activity from today. season 15, where you go basically into the, uh, you go into a throne world type of scenario. I don't know. It, either way, um, the scorn gonna, are practicing scorn logic. Yeah. I'm going to say this real quick and look it up real quick. I don't <laughs> know why. I, I love this Shattered activity. Shattered Realm. Shattered yes. Realm. There it is. Yeah. So in Shattered Realm, the scorn, one of the weeks, <laughs> was practicing sword logic scorn logic so mm. i don't know what, what what do you have to say about that what do you think the scorn's place is in a potential season to tie in with the witch queen so i think there are two different ways in which you go with regards to the scorn story the first is very much tied in with that notion that they're using sword logic a notion which compels i think it was either Mara or Petra or Crow, one of the three, to say that they are evolving in a sense. I do believe it was Mara. Um, and this evolution points to the idea that they are no longer tied to the Elixni. As Scorn, they are a completely different group. And so it's one of these things of they are making their own culture. They are making pacts with darkness by this kind of trial by combat which we came across in the Shattered Realm. And perhaps more importantly than all of that, when you actually look at what they're doing, it is tying them much more directly into the sort of villainous alliance that has been formed between the Taken, the Scorn, the Hive and the Darkness. This, this terrifying group that will now sit there and fight us at every turn contains the Scorn and they're doing so quite willingly. So that's kind of the first avenue. The second avenue is with regards to a character which we really haven't heard much of for years, and that's the Fnatic. You know, the Fnatic appears as a Nightfall Strike every once in a while, and canonically, um, Fickrol, the Fnatic, is continuously resurrected over and over and over again, and the Guardian Fire teams are always going on patrol to kind of push him back and make sure he doesn't overtake any areas. But it is one of these moments where, with the Tangled Shore being sunset, we don't know what Fickrel the Fanatic is going to be doing next. And I think it's even more important because for those of you who've not played Forsaken and for those of you who don't know, the reason that Fickrel the Fanatic is even a thing in the first place, the reason why the Scorn even exists as a result, is a complex interplay between Prince Aldrin, who of course is now Crow, Savathun, and Riven. And so two of those characters, quite keyly, are linked together in the potential plot of Witch Queen. So if you have something along the lines of a Scorn presence in the throne world of Savathun, I think it's entirely possible that you sit there and you see a fanatic that's had this kind of come to Jesus moment where he sits there and he says, look, the Scorn are not so complex, uh, sorry, not so simple that we are only fighting in one sense. I see now all of the reasons why I was manipulated. I see now that there is a real reason why I am here and why I'm trapped in this cursed existence. And it's her, it's Savathun. She is the ultimate cause of it. And so I'm here with those who are loyal to me to try and bring this on and to sort of bring her to justice. Conversely, could just be the fact that it's, you know, the darkness scorn and the fanatic might be allying himself even more keenly in that note because He's no longer got Aldrin, he's got Crow, and Crow is a guardian now. And that seems like a very direct betrayal. And any scorn that sort of see Crow, see Aldrin, and then see him as a guardian and see that as a massive betrayal. And there's literal lore of them attacking him. So there's two avenues through which you could go. But either way, the scorn, I think, have a very prominent place in the future. And I think it's all up to Bungie to continue to craft that. Oh yeah, I think I think the scorn and crow have to have to be the that that to me just screams a huge plot point in a season or it, like that that just that just screams something um, that maybe you know because crow last time we talked to him he uh, he left to go to Venus I believe and to explore more about himself and learn about himself and learn about who he was. 
because Savathun just kind of refreshed his memory um, and of all the bad things that he had done. So I think we're going to see that. I think we see the we see Crow and we see the Scorn um, hashing it out and and fighting and and you know we see something happening. And I do think um, that the fanatic may have a role to play here because the fanatic very much considered didn't he consider the crow or Aldrin at the time his father yeah, i want to say he did him, yeah no he calls him father pretty persistently it's actually the first word that he spoke when he became a scorn and when he was resurrected uh, was he looked at, at Aldrin and called him father out of reflexiveness and instinct clearly because i think it's one of these moments where he sat there woke up and thought that he'd actually gone to some kind of afterlife and was that like, dad is that you? You know, it's yeah. a very kind of like poignant moment, but it stuck. And Aldrin is now very much, well, Aldrin was very much there and was taking on that kind of role as a father figure. And by extension of having that connection with the fanatic was controlling the scorn barons. But it's one of these moments now where that has been completely shattered. So mm -hmm. yeah, all sorts of cool story beats can arise from that. Very, very excited for the scorn in the Witch Queen. Very, very excited because I think they were for a long time i think the last time we talked about this i i want to say in the last video we made i remember us saying the scorn eh, there's not really anything until bungie wants to make a story for them but now we're sitting here going okay the scorn have a, a fairly good chunk they have to they they kind of are like their own i i, I want to say kind of sympathetic race of, of aliens because they're like basically a bunch of frankensteins running around that didn't choose to be there but are there and so hmm. it's very very interesting i'm gonna go ahead and put i'm gonna put my neck out a little bit on this one and yeah whilst i think it's fairly easy to say that like a scorn season i think is not at all impossible at this point especially if you have all these strong story threads that can potentially bring them together i think that in the sort of past um final shape era in the quote-unquote beyond as we're calling it yeah, I think that it's possible we could get an entire Scorn expansion. Like, I, I really do feel as though there's enough there that if it's built on over the next few years progressively, we could see some strong characters emerge. And especially if Crow is another character going forward that we're still talking with and working with, maybe we do get to a point where the Scorn are big enough to warrant an expansion. And maybe that's something where the Fnatic does play a central role. Maybe it's a question of the fate of the Scorn entirely. Do they sit there and carve their own free kind of fate? Or is it something where they are ultimately fighting for the purpose of their soul, of whether they are going to be tied to the darkness or whether they're going to be free? You know, big questions can arise from stuff like this, and I think we just haven't seen them answered oh, yet. That's so awesome. I, I love... One of the things that I love about the Scorn more than any other race is, A, they're, they're just different, but also, B... Um, they just have like such cool like they have like a, almost a Mad Max like post-apocalyptic architecture and I just I would love to see that in a raid I would love to see that in more strikes like I love like the the cool Mad Max theme that it felt like you were in Forsaken all those missions you know the rider the mad bomber like all those things were just so cool and uh I'm just really hopeful that the scorn can can be back as a part of like a, like a cool season or an entire DLC I think it'd be really cool Mm. It really makes me want to say, like, Bungie should just grab the Mad Bomber, the Rider, and the Rifleman and combine those characters into one, not literally, so to speak, but create a character that cre combines those archetypes, have them yep. be sort of like a foil to us throughout a, a number of seasons, and then just create this little infamous side villain, almost like an undead Randall the Vandal. <laughs> Dude. You know? And oh, just no. Have that be, like, could you imagine, though, right? Like, we have this thing, I don't know, maybe like... Uh, like, are you saying, like, a scorn Mandalorian? <laughs> like, just a constant bounty hunter out there, just on his own? Yes. That'd yeah, be really no, cool. Something like that would be awesome. Like, yeah. I don't know. For the sake of, uh, for the sake of keeping it Mimi and close. Let's call. Let's say they're called Thanix. Yeah, not, not, not Thanix. 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 Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, that's totally it, right? <laughs> With an F because they're scorned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, you know, it's going to be one of those moments where we're in a season and we're about to kill the big bad, and then all of a sudden, like 
our gun gets shot out of our hand <laughs> and then we need to take cover and it's like over in the corner we see Thanix again and then it's just he gives the little wave and salute and transmats out and it's like you know you and your ghost sit there and it's like one day we're gonna kill that yeah bloody score. <laughs> like you know it's one of these moments I, I really foresee like cool story moments like that happening especially as it becomes more clear that the longer they live the more intelligent scorn become yeah so the greatest, like the fanatic is the key example of this and the fact that there are more long-lived members of their culture that have been creating these rituals tying them to darkness is another example of this but imagine for a second their most skilled warriors being the ones that have survived longest and therefore as a result being the ones that are more likely to develop into characters like this over time you know this this i think gives a really clear pathway of development for everything i think um also when it comes to just like how they've developed knowledge over time it almost makes me wonder if the scorn are kind of like a like i wonder if it's like bungie's attempt of telling a, a a different version of planet of the apes where like the scorn are just like they just want to do their own thing at a certain point and not have us interfere and you know there's like that war back and forth and they and the fanatic is like their caesar like their leader you know mm. that it's kind of cool it makes me wonder how that links into the uh, the obvious point of all of this. And for those of you who don't know, Scorn are undead elixir, which is why we keep talking about them being Frankenstein and yeah. having these interesting motivations. But the reason why that's really good... Uh, did I just say elixir instead of fallen? I think I did. You did, but uh, yeah. you know what? That really confuses it. Undead fallen. They are undead, undead fallen. fallen, yeah. Yeah, and that, you know, this is part of the reason why everything for them is really interesting. But you mentioned Planet of the Apes. Um, oh my goodness, can you imagine a point at which we then have potential future Fallen stories? I, I do not think we're going to see something like this for a long time, because I think that for the moment the Fallen's story is very much grounded here in the solar system around Earth and around everything that's been happening and more recent seasonal events, but a Fallen return to uh, their home system kind of moment where they go back to their original system of Reese. Uh, would be very interesting from a Planet of the Apes perspective with the Scorn, um, especially considering that those worlds fell to the Hive and to darkness. It's a very interesting idea of what might happen, and uh, oh man, I, I really am looking forward to ideas of that too. Mm -hmm. I think, oh my god, can you imagine like a faction <laughs> of Fallen trying, yeah, like that, and you know what? That is, because uh, that's pretty much all we had for Scorn. I think that's a good opportunity to transition into Fallen and just start with the Scorn to the Fallen. Um, okay, so the Fallen, right? Like, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like what you were saying. It's like the Fallen's interference with the Scorn or like the fact that the Scorn are undead Fallen. It's like a resurrected Fallen. It's like, there's a part of me that's like, I wonder if the Fallen... Uh want to fight the scorn over this or if there's like because you're right the fallen story is pretty self-contained out of every story that we've that we've talked about everything has like a, a connection here and there but the fallen story especially in beyond light it felt like we had this talk about the pyramids and the pyramids are invading and x y and z ah, dude i said it again but it's like the pyramids are invading and then the fallen are just kind of yeah we're we're on Europa and we have the darkness, but it's a totally separate story than what's already going on and once that story finished and I mean Mithrax's story in the House of Light once that story finished It's like the fallen Kind of are just at this weird spot where it's like, okay, cool. We'll, we'll put you over to the side for now um, Don't really know what's going on. Maybe your story is finished or maybe the Scorn are a way to reintroduce the story where the Fallen are going, hey, it's not okay that the Scorn even exists. They're just undead versions of us. I think there's definitely a contingent of uh, Fallen who would sit there and say that. I think that in particular, there are those who, uh, maybe in the House of Light, are very much tied to the light. The idea that these beings are effectively darkness-infused versions of themselves is kind of abhorrent to them, let alone the fact that they are undead Fallen. But I will sit there and say that more so than most other factions, the Fallen story has always contained a lot of internal politics and squabbling. You know, the fact that they were split from the moment they entered our solar system into a bunch of different warring houses that were led by their own 
chieftain-like figures in the form of the Kells, the fact that they had their own religious idols in the forms of the Servitors, that they had the high priests of the Archons that were able to commune between those two groups and effectively interpret their roles. It means that they're bound up not only in a lot of politics, but also in a lot of religion and prophecy in that sense. And what I think is really cool to, to look at with all of this is not only where all of that leads, the Elixir in the future, but what it does to them in the immediate potential future seasons and potential future expansions and what that does for them as an ally of us. So I think there's a lot of different threads you can pick up on that, but the big one that I really do want to pick up on is the simple question of whether Eremis is in fact dead or not, and by extension, a sort of tangent that will potentially be a good reason for her to re-enter the story as a kind of a uh, villain that we can potentially fight against and that can be a foil to a protagonist who is going to be the fabled Kell of Kells. So it requires a little bit of explanation, but to boil it down, to cut it really short, there is a fallen legend of a character known as the Kell of Kells who is basically going to be acknowledged by the Traveler, who is going to uplift the fallen people again, and who is going to represent the entirety of their species. And this, I think, is a really kind of like important moment for the fallen in their story is that this moment has not happened yet but there are some very clear contenders for that kel of kel's kind of position you know you look at mithrax you look at ido you look potentially even at varix and you see these individuals who have all sat there and either know the mythology or qualify to be its leading figure and they need a villain and i think that's kind of where all of the story for the fallen can coalesce is where they become, well, unfallen, where we know them less as fallen and more as Elixney, because they at this point would be our chief allies. They would effectively be like the elites in Halo to the Spartans and humanity. You know, not that that comparison has ever been made before. It's totally original. No one else has grabbed it, just me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, think, I, I think that's the big threat. I think the, that's the big one. I agree. And I think Aramis is definitely not dead and it's like there's a part of me that just hates that she's not dead because it's like why keep her alive in this self-contained story did she need to be alive but there's also a part of me that's like well hell yeah man there's like a season where we can go back to europa and somebody unthawed air <laughs> somebody unthawed her maybe she just pressed v on her keyboard enough times so she broke out but uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's like, there has to be a reason why they kept her alive and why they kept her there. You know, there's a part of me that is always going to think, well, maybe they did it so that they could show off her being frozen and it's like a cool statue there, but there's no closure on it. There's no writing. There's no, there's no line from Argos that says she's 100% dead. She is not going to come back. You know, there's nothing like mm -hmm. that. And they left a health bar there on purpose. Um, they would have they would have had the health bar go down to nothing if if she was actually dead. They've never done something like that before. So I do see a scenario where somebody frees her from the ice somehow. I do see a a, a fight for the Kell of Kells again because you know Aramis very much tried to establish herself as the Kell of Kells, like many other fallen villains have. Um, and I do see. Mithrax being involved in whatever plot line there is simply because uh, he would be the best person. I mean, he's a he's a fallen. He's he is the he is the Kell of Kells for the House of Light. You know, he is the Kell of, of the House of Light, or I guess they don't even really follow the same allegiance. But um, I do see a potential Saint 14 Mithrax Master Chief Arbiter scenario of let's go fight Aramis again. Let's go back to Europa and, and deal mm. with this. And even more to sort of solidify that last point of Saint-14 and Mithrax having an alliance, so to speak. Obviously, they got very friendly at the end of Season of the Splicer, and it was this thing of buddy-buddy for sure. But even down to the stuff that happened in the Season of Arrivals a season later, some of the earliest lore that we got was Saint-14 asked Mithrax for help when looking for Osiris. And it was this moment of like, hey, I can't do this alone. But I know that you have the skills to do this. And they infiltrate the Vex network looking for him. You know, it's another thing if they go ahead and do effectively an override mission together. Yeah. And Saint-14 is defending and Mithrax is doing the splice. And it's 
you know, it sets up these little moments that we could see in the future of those two effectively being the ultimate buddy cops that we kind of knew they were going to be at some point. Yeah, it was. I mean, season of the Lost definitely had a lot of uh, a lot of really cool, mature next steps for characters, and I do see Mithrax having a huge, maybe not a maybe not a massive massive um, role to play, but I do see Mithrax fighting for that Kel of Kells and fighting against the idea that every single fallen faction has to be this separate thing with their own internal politics. I do see Mithrax trying to unite more and more fallen to the cause of the light. Um, but at the same time, I think Aramis has to die for that to fully happen. And I, I think Aramis is not dead. And I do think Aramis is a plot to potentially happen. And I mean, Bungie has laid out their game plan um, for the next year that they want a dungeon or a raid every other season. For every every season, there will be a dungeon or a raid, which is awesome. Love that. Um, there's a part of me then that wonders: Will we see a return to the Deepstone Crypt, and will we, we will we see a dungeon perhaps in the Deepstone Crypt against an Aramis, an Exo Aramis, the way that Atrax turned herself into an Exo as well? Like, I wonder if those things are a potential. I would love for those things to happen. I think that the Deepstone Crypts generally is going to be this onward story point that provides a degree of danger that we need to be aware of. I mean, if you look at, say, um, even just the season of The Chosen, we literally had one instance where one of the missions where we had to go and kill one of the Cabal Commanders was set inside of X installation, but it's made very clear at the beginning that they were looking for the Deepstone Crypt to try and create Exo Cabal, or to try and salvage technology from that that would create advantage. And even if you sit there and forget about the idea of creating Exo Cabal in the first place, you've got to remember what's at the heart of the Deepstone Crypt, which is an aspect of darkness. It's one of the statues that has projected a dark aura and has allowed Clovis Bray to create the Exos in the first place. So you sit there and you realize that effectively it's trying to keep kids away from a counterpeg, really. Yeah. A counterpeg? A counterpeg. A counterpeg. <laughs> that's a, that's, the, that's the scorn version. That's fine. We're good. <laughs> it's all backwards. It's all upside down. Um, yeah, no. It's trying to keep kids away from a powder keg is effectively what you're doing. And so the Deepstone Crypt, no matter what you do, I think is going to always be something that's going to be in the back of the mind of anybody who visits Europa. And I don't think that it's going to be a destination that's very throwaway in that sense, especially because even if you ignore the Deepstone Crypt and the technology of the Exos together, you still have a literal pyramid ship out on its surface with a ziggurat out in the beyond area that we can go to. And all of it basically sits there and indicates to us quite clearly that, yeah, this is going to be something which we need to be aware of in the future. And the other characters are definitely aware of even as they don't necessarily completely align to the darkness in some instances, that's still a terrifying, dangerous source of power, or just something that should generally be avoided because the statue has killed people. Yeah. So, you know, like, this, I, I feel like there's potential in the Deepstone Crypt for a whole lot of different story beats. Um, regardless of whether that ends up being something with the Fallen again, I still am really excited to see where that goes. Yeah, because I, I don't think the Deepstone Crypt is done. I, I really don't. I mean, if anything, we just lowered its defenses, you know, mm. for something Everyone to come in. Everyone has access. Everyone yeah. has access now. And I think Clovis even says that the, the when you're running through um, after the third encounter, the descent, um, when you're running through the hallways while it's blowing up, I think he when he says that you're a clever little rat and that it says that we've lowered the defenses of the Deepstone Crypt so now anybody has access. So mm. I think there is a possibility of that place returning. And, you know, I watched the ride along. I don't know if you had the opportunity to watch the ride along for Deepstone Crypt, but they talked, they, they showed um, concept art of Deepstone Crypt and they showed visuals of what it was originally going to look like. And it looks like they could still use those assets to tell a different story and like go to a new place within the Deepstone Crypt. And I, I would love to see that, like whether it happens, no clue. Um, that's why we're making this video it's all speculation, but it would just be really cool. And I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for the Deepstone Crypt. I mean, in my opinion, I don't think we got to see a proper look at the big making of Exos. You know, I don't think like we saw Tanix come out of the pod and we saw Atrax already 
as an EXO, but we didn't really get to see the process of an EXO being made. And I think that would be really cool to see in the crypt. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I feel like there's more potential for it generally. Like, as a storytelling device, it sits there kind of permanently now. Not by nature of some kind of thing that's keeping it tied there forever, but by the fact that we kind of just have to defend that thing. And in that sense, I think that there's always going to be potential for story. And that makes me very excited. Same. I, I, yeah, I'm very, very excited for anything to do with that place. And also just Fallen and where they go next. Like, I think that's another just huge one. It's like we, we have to constantly ask questions of like, where do the Fallen go? Who is going to be responsible? Who is going to be the player? And I mean, Bungie, as much as I hate to say this, could always just throw out another character from a house, from a different house, if they wanted to. You know, they, they could always just do that. They could pull out a, a, a fallen, they could pull out a Kel from a, from a house that we don't know about, or a house that does exist already, but has a new Kel of Kells, or claiming to be the Kel of Kells that we have to go defeat for a season. They can always pull that one out with the fallen and... That's why I've, I've liked and I've always disliked the Fallen story is because it's kind of self-contained, which is really cool. And I like the internal politics and how it kind of relates to our own world. Um, but at the same time, it's like they can always just th have some pretty throwaway villains as a result or what, what at least feels like a throwaway villain because there's not enough time to give the backstory properly. You know, I chuckle there just a little bit because you sit there and you're like, you know, maybe some other fallen arises from some other house maybe they don't need a house at all maybe it's just we we, we go back to tanix for the 15th time and, oh my you know, god like we, we sit there and this time it's tanix but he's got kel of kel's energy and he's like look i've died so many times i must be a guardian now come on <laughs> i uh i i told in the last time i i covered anything to do with tanix i i think it was in the I think it was in the Sabathun video, but I I told everybody I was like, you know, if they if they have Tanix if Tanix comes back one more time, we'll do a whole history of Tanix and just go over every single time he showed up. Like, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> oh man. Um. Okay. I'm telling well, you, dude, Darkness Tanix is totally gonna be a thing at some point. It's I'm gonna be a thing. It's gonna be a thing. It's, it's too it's too meme worthy at this point for it to not be a thing. Oh like, God. Tan <laughs> just let him die let him die or let him just be out there somewhere i i don't know um okay so we have covered if, if you are you know kind of listening to this in the background or you're actively listening to this and you haven't taken a break uh props to you um we have covered hive we have covered scorn we have covered the cabal we have covered the fallen and we have covered um the nine now, where do you want to go next, Bife? Where, where do you want to I go next? We, we mentioned Deepstone Crypt, and while there isn't a lot to go over, I feel like it's worth putting a little moment in for the Vex here and there, because there are some, there is at least one interesting story thread that I think can be picked up on. So the last time we talked about the Vex, or the last time we had anything to do with the Vex, was in the season of The Chosen, which had to deal with Coria and the Vex uh, network. Season oh, of the Splicer. Of the splicer. Yes. Oh my god, why did I say chosen? Well, it's okay. Yeah. We can, it's okay. We can cut these things out. True. The magic true. of edit. True. Um, I'm just gonna leave it all in. I, I you know, what our mistakes oh, damn, are brave. Our our mistakes are, are are being shown publicly. Um so I'm gonna say that with the season of the splicer, Coria, the last time we know about it is when we killed Coria, they said a line of I think they said that Coria split herself into a bunch of different realities and that Coria is in like every universe now or something like that but basically Coria is dead in our universe i'm just gonna say that Coria, Coria is dead mm. effectively yes Corio is 100 percent dead and that creates a bit of a problem in a sense for the vex story because a story needs characters and it needs motivation you can have the vex being this unknowable force and this strange gestalt intelligence of cyborgs for a bit. But it is also one of these moments where you need to acknowledge, like, hey, for us to have some kind of connection to a group as a sort of villain in the story, or even to have some kind of reason to go and fight against them, there needs to be characters. And there is still a character out there that is connected to the Vex, although 
It's one that I think we need a little bit more development on, one that I think could appear in a season coming forward, and that's Asha Mir. So, for those of you who don't know, Asha Mir has a connection to the Vex constantly. Asha Mir, if you didn't play D2 Vanilla, is a warlock who was infected with Vex Radialaria, the kind of white mind goop that's in the middle of all the Vex, and he had a Vex arm. You know, he's being slowly turned into a Vex. And by the time we get to the Season of Arrivals, which was point at which Asha Mir and his planet of Io, which, well, his moon of Io, rather, which he was the vendor for, got sunset, we're looking at a final moment where Asher decides to join the Vex. There's a little bit of lore where it talks about how he went to the center of the Radiolarian Lake in the Pyramidian, which was a Vex structure on Io. And he, after having killed Vex to get through to there, was eventually allowed passage by them. They sort of stood by and let him get to the center. And he eventually let the Lake of Radiolaria crash down on him and became one with the Vex. And we know that this has now happened, and the reason for that is because Season of the Splicer, in that final override, in the top left building, as you uh, enter all of this stuff, you can sit there and you can find a strange blue-eyed harpy. And the reason that matters is because blue-eyed harpies have always represented characters and Vex units that are friendly, and it beeps at you in Morse code and says the word assistant. It's such a weird tangential thing to bring up, but assistant is the way that Asher referred to you. And so it's one of these moments where you sit back and you realize, oh, he did become one with the Vex, and if he is one with the Vex, he still probably has maintained a degree of his self. And so that brings us to the really interesting question of why he did that. And the vague implication is that he's doing it so that he can sort of unite with them as a means of trying to stop the darkness from accessing the Vex's better information held within the Pyramidian. But his character leaves us a story thread that we could go for, which is any group of Guardians or any character that has fallen in with the Vex. So you're looking at Ashamir, you're looking at Kabir the Legionless, you're looking at maybe the Ishtar researchers from long ago, you're looking at Praedith. These are all characters we might see in a future Vex expansion. 100%. And I, I, I don't really have anything else to say. I think you just hit it right on the head. Um, I think that that's the only place where the Vex could respectively go. Um, I do think that the Vex, the Vex's story, I, I wonder if there's anything for the Witch Queen that involves the Vex. Maybe there's some enemies here and there, but nothing that's like major plot point for the Vex being a part of the story. I don't really see that happening. Unless, you know, Bungie wants to pull a secret mission type of deal where, where you know, they can start a story um, that we didn't even know it was going on through just a secret mission. Like, that's always possible, too. So, mm. I don't know. I think, um, I think the Vex don't have a ton right now, but that doesn't mean that the Vex won't have a ton come Lightfall and come Final Shape, and even further. Um... I, I I am very, 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 very interested to see where they go next with the Vex, because I think the Vex have always been sort of the most mysterious um, out of every single race of enemy. Um, they've always had a, like, I'm going to let you kill me because it is working towards this final goal, the final shape. Um, that's always been, like, their MO. So it's really interesting to see what where we go next with them. Mm. Their entire thing of survival, no matter the cost, has led to some really interesting places too. You know, like the thing that always goes back to me is um, in Curse of Osiris, when you sit there and look at the world that the Vex would one day create, which is, you know, like this this world without light or dark, where there isn't any life, there isn't a final shape, it's just Vex. And that's terrifying in a certain sense, because it's this moment of like, hey, you know, these things are truly alien and truly unknowable. You know, like, you can sit down and conceivably within the universe of Destiny, you can have a conversation with a cabal. You can sit there and have this kind of tense moment where you are at blade's edge and blade's throat with a hive, where both of you are trying to kill each other, but you're still able to somewhat actively communicate in the sense of, like, I'm communicating my aggression to you. We're now buddies with the Elixni. The Vex are still about as alien as you can imagine. You know, they are so far from us and so far from our understanding that it almost transcends anything we know. And I think it's pro like, 
they have the ability to be the most interesting enemy if Bungie is able to write them in that sense and if we're able to get something which is just purely about that, you know? I think that a Gestalt intelligence kind of like them is really hard to pull off. But ultimately, they also make it harder because they have the, those individual facets of personality to each of their sub-minds. So it's, it's really cool to see that going forward, but it's just a case of they need to craft more story for it. I think you're right. By the time we get to Lightfall, maybe even by the time we get to Final Shape, there will be a continuous, coherent direction for the Vex. It's just a case of what will that be, you know? Yeah. And I think I think that's going to be the big question this year is setting up a plot for that more than more than anything is like getting getting the Vex back in a position to have a plot because now that Corey is gone, there's kind of like just a just an empty hole there. The same way that we talked about the Scorn last year is the same way that I guess we'll talk about the Vex this year. Where do they go next? Where's the potential and uh, where do they land? And so yeah, are they out of the plot? I don't think so. I think the Vex still have a lot more to go. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to see what they do. Um, speaking of the Vex, and speaking of something that I sent you, and I don't know if you want to put it in the video at this point, I was looking at uh, Twitter the other day, and I saw a picture of a old piece of concept art, very old, from mm. Vanilla Destiny, that was um, Rasputin destroying a Vex Citadel. And it just got me thinking about Rasputin again, and where the hell we go with Rasputin. And does he have involvement with the Vex here? So I'm going to let you speak on this one, because um, I feel like you know more about this than I do. But, I mean, yeah, Rasputin, last time we saw him, it was in the end of Season of Arrivals, the very beginning of Beyond Light. He got turned he got turned off pretty much by the darkness. And um, Anna, I think, took him in, and put him into an engram last time we heard? Uh, yeah, so Anna Bray uh, is part of the reason why... Um, Rasputin is even still in the story. Effectively, there was most of him was obliterated by the darkness, just full on. This time, he, he's, he's he's practically speaking just dead, except for a little bit of code that he was specifically trying to hide away so that he could live on and survive, and that's transmitted into an engram, which effectively, for those of you who don't know, is a means of storing information, like. You always pick up engrams and it turns into loot. The idea is that an engram is data which can then be transmuted into matter. And so what you'll end up getting there is almost like a blueprint which can then be spontaneously 3D printed into the thing that you then have as your exotic or your legendary. So that's kind of the idea of what an engram is. But in terms of what that does for Rasputin, it means that his personality, his knowledge has been retained to an extent. And it's clear that Anna Bray is trying to go ahead and throw all of that knowledge into a frame. Maybe not a uh, frame in the sense of like the sweeper bots, I don't think, but into an exo body perhaps. And this kind of leads us to a really interesting point where supposedly it's the original story of Destiny 1 which got scrapped all those re rewrites ago, years ago, um, back before Destiny 1 had even launched, where Rasputin was supposedly an exo. Now this leads us to really interesting places, obviously, but it also leads us to the story points of saying, hey, how does Rasputin regain his power, and what is Rasputin capable of? And I think it's worth looking back into the past, and this is where Rasputin tangles a little bit with things, and where that Citadel image comes in, which is Rasputin has tangled with the Vex before, uh, and in particular with researchers of a group called the Ishtar Collective, which basically he saved them from the Vex because the Vex were simulating hundreds of different copies of them. I think it's 237 copies of the Ishtar Collective researchers that the Vex made. And for those of you who don't know, when a Vex makes a copy of you and simulates you, it's a perfect simulation and it will continue to be a perfect copy. Like if they copied me and Evan here, it would be one of these moments where there are identical copies of us also having this conversation about how we've also been copied. You know, down to the point where what I'm going to say next, as in, hey, look, I'm randomly talking about a jar of peanut butter, you know, they'd also be saying that because they'd also be wanting to make the same point. And that's all been calculated out by the Vex. Like, that's the degree of terrifying power that the Vex hold. But Rasputin is able to overwhelm even that. And that just sort of shows a degree to how powerful Rasputin really is, and why it's so constantly worth saving him as a character. So moving forward, 
Rasputin has potential to tangle with the Vex, and if there is some means of overpowering them, Rasputin might be the key to that. It also has a really good moment at which we can reintroduce into the story Anna Bray, Elsie Bray, maybe something to do with the Deepstone Crypt, maybe even something to do with Clovis Bray himself. So yeah, really cool ideas and plot points that could arise from that. Yeah, because the last time we were given anything about Rasputin was... I mean, it, it was in the very first cutscene of Beyond Light, so I mean, I think a lot of players thought that they were going to get something pretty substantial with Rasputin and, and something happening with him. And I think a lot of th that hole is still very, very empty. And knowing Bungie and knowing Bungie's history with AI on a small scale with a character, I almost <laughs> feel like Anna Bray and Rasputin is like a reversed... It's like a reverse gender of doing Master Chief and uh, and Cortana. But, mm. you know, it's also kind of like a Vision from Marvel, where Vision is is put is an AI that was that is put into a body. I mean, that's the way that I see it. It's, it's Jarvis put into a body. Mm. I Yeah, honestly, I don't disagree with that either. And also, um, I feel as though he provides the impetus for a lot of the more interesting human stories. Like, we're all... Everyone always talks about the enemy stories and, like, the opposing factions that we get in Destiny. But Rasputin has a very visceral tie to the Golden Age. He has a tie to, obviously, the Bray sisters and Clovis Bray Sr. himself. And he also is a big reflection of humanity's imperfection, not just on a grand scale, but on a micro one. In the grand scheme of things, you know, he comes from the Golden Age, which was this time of progress and advancement and, you know, effectively is supposed to be a utopia, but he also represents a very dark undertone where the people of this utopia sat there and knew that one day it might be shattered. And so they resolved to build a supercomputer AI that was capable of predicting any possible wartime scenario and countering it before it could even enter the system. That was Rasputin's original purpose. But on a micro scale, when you look at how he relates to individuals, he sees humans as not only his charge, but also as kind of beneath him. You know, he even sees guardians as beneath him for the longest time, because it's one of these moments of, it takes up until the season of the worthy for him to kind of accept, like, okay, guardians and him can have a co-equal role in protecting the people of the last city, in protecting humanity generally. And before that, at the end of Warmind, he has the big spiel, where he sits there and says, you know, I am Rasputin, I am the protector of Sol, and I will have no equal. No one will control me. I'll continue to extend my borders out from now onward. And it's just this big refutation of our entire purpose as Guardians, which is Defenders. He's saying, no, you just turned me back on, and now that I'm awake, I can actually do my job again. Thanks, but I'll take it from here. And, you know, it's kind of funny in a sense, because he gets his ass completely clapped. Yeah. He just gets completely destroyed by by the darkness. But, you know, it's it's still one of these moments at which, for him, he reflects a lot of the imperfections of humanity. You know, it's this kind of arrogance born of the Golden Age and something which, to an extent, we need to now sort of reckon with here in this moment. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, you got to think the people that built him, built him with with humanity in mind and, and to think like us in mind, you know? So he is very much a reflection of our imperfections, like you said. And I mean, I, I can totally see a Rasputin storyline where, you know, he gets into an exo body, there's conflict between Anna and Clovis, because even though they sort of worked out their issues, they didn't fully, you know? Like, I, I think we kind of left off the plot of Beyond Light with, I, I want to say with Anna and Clovis not really getting along. Like, I don't think it, I don't think it ended all too well. I could be wrong though. I, 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 it's been a long time since I looked at it, but maybe they worked it out. Maybe they didn't. I thought Anna ran away was like the final thing from Anna. I mean, effectively it's one of these uh, moments where they get that final confrontation with Clovis Bray and Anna and Elsie standing there. And effectively, it's one of these things if they say, kind of, oh, shut up, old man, we're going to deal with our futures from here on outward. So yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a very strange kind of moment, but it does leave them in this point of them saying like, hey, I know how you think, and I know you think that your power dynamic still exists, but we have moved on, and we are going to say goodbye now. And I think they literally shut him off for a little bit, and they just like shut him down. Yeah, 
I I think, man, I want to say that we're going to see maybe not even may, maybe Clovis involved, but I really think that at the very least Elsie is involved somehow with Anna. It's going to be Elsie and Anna and Rasputin in that storyline, and I do think it's a return to Europa, and that it could be the Deepstone Crypt. It could be. You know, just in Clovis's facility, maybe they need to turn Clovis back on to to build Rasputin because Clovis powers the whole area, and you know, there's a million different things that it could go with. Um, but I, you know, now that now that I've I've gotten to start think about Beyond Light story even more, and you know, we've talked about potential places for um, Elsie and Anna and Rasputin. And we know that Eris Morn is going to be a part, somehow, some way. Eris is going to be a part of the Witch Queen. I mean, you see her in the newest trailer that came out, um, talking to one of the people that went and, and discovered and, and saw Savathun. Um, so I wonder, we know that that's where Eris is. We know that Elsie had a huge play in Beyond Light and could have a huge play in a season or a future DLC. Now we have to talk about the third one. What's what is the drifter doing? What 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 is happening since like Europa? Because he was there and he was part of the promotional material. He said a few lines. He was part of the Salvation's Grip quest. Our ghost made fun of him. But like, where is he? What is going on with him? Mm. The drifter's mo, I think, is slowly changing. You know, like I think that. He's always been a survivalist at heart, and even in the season of The Drifter, he sits there and says, look, darkness is coming to the system, bad things will happen, I think it's time for us to go ahead and get ready to become our own sort of group of survivors, there's a place on my ship if you want it. I think that now he's slowly starting to get attached to the Guardians, you know, he has his place in the tower now, he's moved on from the little nook that he's got, he's got a full-on bank as of Season of Arrivals just sitting there in the middle of it all. I think that he is slowly starting to realize, yeah, he's always been a survivor, but I think he recalculates his chances and for the moment says like, this is where I've probably got my best chance of survival is surrounded by all these people who maybe don't trust me completely, but definitely don't want me dead and are definitely going to fight and defend me as well. You yeah, know? yeah, no, and, and I just don't know where they really go with him though, like, because yes, now he realizes that and he's kind of had his story arc, but like, where is he... Do you think his story lies in be in in uh, Lightfall? Do you think his story lies in the Witch Queen? Like I don't I don't know where they where they go with him. In a sense, I think that some characters in some narratives are kind of pillars of a certain way that things always are. They're constants. So it's it, it's an example that maybe uh, makes some chuckle. But the one thing that comes to mind for me is if you've seen um, the the Clone Wars and Rebels, I think of Hondo, you know, I, if particularly for someone like the Drifter, I think of this character who realistically knows exactly who they are in a certain sense. They, they've sat there and they're able to acknowledge where their allegiances truly lie, which is always to themselves. But they also acknowledge that having friends from time to time is a good thing, and it's one of these moments of they will forever be the opportunist. And I think that to that extent, I think that that's kind of where the Drifter always is. I don't think that he necessarily has this massive kind of big plot-driven thing going forward that he's going to undertake. I think if that does happen, it's going to happen with the Nine, but Lord knows when their story will be fully fleshed out and evolved in a way that involves the Drifter again. But ultimately, I do think that to an extent... A universe always needs its, its its kind of scoundrels, and I think that for the moment, especially with Cade gone, you know, we, we've got the Drifter. That's kind of that's kind of our deal for the moment. He will always be a scoundrel, and will always be there to sort of insert himself in the seasonal story wherever is appropriate. Yeah, no, that's fair. I, yeah, that that does make a lot more sense. I don't necessarily think any more of like I, I don't know. I I always thought of like the Drifter as like this you know, mysterious figure and, you know, constantly, constantly involved in cutscenes and story beats. But, eh, you know, if you think about it now, it's like, well, he could just be, he's just a part of this vanguard, this sort of dark vanguard that Eris and Elsie are a part of. And he's just one of them. And he's just a pillar, like you said, that's just, you know, narratively 
He's going to be involved in cutscenes, maybe here and there. He's going to be involved in some dialogue, some back and forth. Maybe he'll be involved in a season or two somewhere, but I agree. I don't know if he's ever going to be like a main plot point again. Um, I, okay. I do want to say one thing because we are coming up on the two hour mark, which it's flown by. Um, yeah, two hours. Ooh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. We're coming up on the two hour mark. So I don't want to go so much longer. But I do want to talk about uh, the one thing that we mentioned at the beginning of the video and we said we would get to, and it does have to do with the Drifter since he can kind of summon them with moats and, and, and with in the Gambit, he can summon them. Uh, Taken. Taken. The raid. Where did Taken fall into place? The entity. All this stuff. What are your thoughts? I think we are seeing the true nature of the Taken as of season of um, season of the Lost. And the reason I say that is because there's this very poignant sentence that's spoken by Mara, which basically says that the Taken are no longer under Savathun's control. They've returned to the control of their original master, and that master was not Oryx. And this leads back to so many hints and so many clues that we've gotten about the quote-unquote voice behind the darkness, the entity that is truly the foil and by now looks to be the equivalent of the Traveler. We've seen them mentioned not only in the Shadowkeep campaign where we've got the unveiling law book, they reach out to us and they actually have the conversations. We see the statue vision from the Shadowkeep campaign where it seems quite clear that they take on our form and talk to us. There is the moment at which you sit there and you see something rather remarkable happen aboard the Glycan where you see that they all of a sudden had Callus's attempts to communicate with the entity. You had, of course, Beyond Light, where we communed with the darkness itself. And then fold all of that together into this idea that there is something which Mara went out into the darkness of space to fight, something which she had to be brought back into the Dreaming City to be saved from, kind of, during the narrative arc of the Season of the Lost. It wasn't realistically her being saved, but was her being brought to a place where she could help her people more effectively. But all of it ties together with this simple idea of an entity and something which is so powerful that not only does it clearly control and has originally created the Taken, but is probably the mover behind all the forces of darkness. And that's where I think the Taken storyline is bound up. I think that their allegiance as one of the true forces of darkness, maybe not the true force, but one of the true forces of darkness is finally revealed. And I think that is one of the most important points in their story. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I do think that whatever we're going to see next from the Taken, it's it's going to get real dark and real like it's going to get real dark real quick. Um, I do think that this next raid is going to be very much like even though people don't necessarily want to hear this, I think it's going to be a Taken raid, and I do think you're right. I think we're going to see this whole entire plot line with whatever the Entity is, the Entity, all this stuff. I think you're going to hear the name The Entity a ton right after Sabathun's plot line is over. Um, mm. I think yeah, I think there's so much potential there, and are we going to see a true darkness race? Uh, I don't know. Is the Taken going to be that representation for a long time? Well, it kind of already has been, but will the Taken be a part of that? Or are the Taken a part of the, the final narrative for the game? I, I do think so. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that now that Sabathun doesn't have control, I think that Taken are going to be very much controlled by the overarching darkness entity. Mm. And I think as well, the Taken in a certain respect represent this kind of perfect... Um, perfect symbolism of what the darkness realistically does with its entire thing. They're, they're shelled out remnants of who they used to be. You know, you'll look at a Taken goblin, for example. Yeah, that used to be a Vex, but ultimately you're looking at something which now has had its entire purpose changed and it serves only the darkness and only as whatever it's designed to serve as and it's been moved closer towards the perfect vision of the darkness's final shape and i think ultimately that moves the dial a little bit that moves everybody into this place and saying like hey 
if we're really going to be looking at the big narrative arc of Destiny's story going forward, the day can have a place, but only in the sense that an emperor has his thralls. You know, I, I sit there and think that they are the ideal servants of darkness, and that if there is some kind of greater hierarchy of the darkness, or maybe even a darkness race, it's a funny way of saying that as previously under Oryx, they were kind of subservient to the Hive and were sort of shock troops to them. They'll be shock troops to whoever this darkness faction is as well. Yeah, wow, that's some heavy stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, man. Okay, well, I think, is that just about everything that we wanted to cover then? Yeah, I mean, that's mostly it. I think we've we've covered a lot of stuff. We've got a lot of predictions out there. We've thrown some ideas about where characters are going and character arcs and things. And yeah, I think we'll have to see when Witch Queen releases at this point. 100%. Um, well, thank you so much, Bife, again, for joining me on this. I know this is, this is kind of becoming like a yearly tradition at this point, you know, but uh, mm. it's been awesome having you on again and there's just so much going on in Destiny right now and so many places. And I hope that everybody at home that's listening, um, wherever you are listening to this, I hope that you've kind of understood or sort of learned something new, or maybe you have some ideas on some things where we can go next. And maybe you want to leave some comments on what you think is going to happen next. And I'll be sure to read over them. I'm sure Bife will do the same. And uh, again, oh, guys, yeah. make sure you go and subscribe to My Name is Bife on YouTube, please. He is, I mean, he is so close to getting that 1 million. He is less than, well, I want to say so close because it's going to happen, but I, I, I don't know, man. Let's try to, let's try to get everybody from my community to go over there and subscribe and just push it as far as we can. And likewise, if you haven't seen any of Evan's videos and you're over here on my channel watching, he'll be linked up in the description as you'd expect. But more importantly than that, his content is genuinely worth watching. And as the title Chronicler is often thrown around, I think that as far as the real history of Destiny as a video game is concerned, Evan is the real Chronicler. Whenever it comes down to a, an event that happens, such as, say, Niobe Labs or the hunt for the 15th wish, Evan has been there to make some real really in-depth and appropriately memey, but also very informative guides that really give you an insight into a time in Destiny that you might not have experienced. His stuff has always been really well done and well researched, and oftentimes he does his best to bring you back to the moments when it happened. So go ahead, check out some of his stuff if you really want what I think is probably one of the best videos to start watching his content at. Go ahead and look at the Last Wish Raid video that he did, which goes over the raid race of Last Wish and talks about how it was one of the most incredible moments in Destiny's history and how ultimately it was only beaten on day one by two fire teams. So yeah, that's uh, that's my recommendation at the very least. Yeah, and if you guys want my recommendation, I mean, well, I guess the best one to start with for Bife is the complete story of Destiny. If you do not know what's going on in Destiny, Watch the complete story of Destiny. It is almost four hours long. It has deservingly got a lot of views on it. So go and watch that. I remember I remember listening to that video when I was on a road trip back home. Um <laughs> I, I'm not even joking. I, I just I threw it up on my phone and like it would it would buffer here and there because I was going through some dead zones, but me and my friend just listened to the whole entire story and we were just like, oh my god, this is so awesome, like the whole way through. Enjoy so. another four hours of audio content, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. to go with the two-hour podcast you just listened to. <laughs> exactly. I know you guys like long-form stuff, um, so yeah, give, give it a listen, man. And thank you guys so much for joining us on this video. Um, means a lot that, you know, everybody's continuing to support, so thank you. Any last words, Mr. Bife? Nah, simply thank you so much everyone for watching, thank you for all the support, I look forward to seeing everybody when it comes to Witch Queen, I look forward to being wrong, I look forward to being right on all of these, and if you're ever on my channel and you're uh, listening to this for the last time, as per usual, uh, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. Uh, Porodasia Adastra. See you all starside. Thank you guys for watching, bye bye.